Hello and welcome to another episode of The Open Road, a podcast where we discuss aspects of open source community and community building. My name is Rich Bowen and I'm with the Open Source Program Office at Red Hat. And I'm Brian Proffitt, also with the Red Hat uh, Open Source Program Office. Thank you for joining us. In this episode, we're going to be talking about a uh, what what might be an uncomfortable issue for some of our listeners, and that's diversity and equity and inclusion. And what I'd like to encourage you to do as you listen is if this is a topic that makes you uncomfortable, be uncomfortable. Think about why it makes you uncomfortable. And, and listen to our really excellent guests talk about some of the topics that we raised around this issue. Exactly. Yeah, because Rich and I, um, we have some amazing guests that we talked to when we were building this collection of episodes around uh, DEI, as we'll refer to it sometimes. Um, and, you know, we were very cognizant of the fact that, you know, he and I are not necessarily representative of, of a diverse uh, uh, culture. Um, but we are both, you know, very passionate about uh, open source community building and best practices. And in that work, each one of us has come across a lot of uh, times where we've had to really communicate the message of DEI to other community members. And that can be an easy conversation and it can be a difficult conversation. And we're really hoping that this set of episodes will help highlight those difficulties and, and give people ideas on how to, you know, manage your communities in such a way to make diversity, um, you know, more apparent. So we have three guests and each of them in one way or another is in a role where they help to educate about these issues and increase diversity in their organization or in their open source project or foundation. And we asked them a number of questions that, uh, you know, delved into some of the challenges around increasing diversity in open source. Mm -hmm. And to get the conversation started, the first question that we asked each of our guests when we interviewed them was pretty much the big opener, which was what is the biggest challenge to you know diversity, equity, and inclusion in any community, whether it be an organization, open source community, what have you. Um, and the first person we asked this question to was Griselda Cuevas. She is currently the, a product manager uh, for Google Account Security. Um, she has also done extensive work with the Apache Foundation um, and around uh, DEI issues. And so we posed this question to her and here's how that conversation went. Uh, I'm taking a, a minute to think here because when I hear the word challenge, a few people think about uh, friction points mm -hmm. and, all, and other people think about lack of opportunity. And I think like these two are a little bit different. And to me, friction, it's more like something that's difficult and, you know, people have tried and it's just it requires a lot of effort to overcome. It's like the friction point, whereas like the lack of opportunity, it's a bit more related to what you say, like, we don't know what we don't know. And sometimes you don't know that you have a diversity opportunity or problem just because you are not exposed to it or you haven't seen it. And that is what, uh, the two, the two, the two type of things that I will try to to convey in this in this answer. The first one, the frictions. Well, let me let's just start with the, the the lack of awareness or the the lack of exposure, which mm -hmm. is, I think, the core of like of diversity being a, a conversation. I believe that um, open source that the core of it as i saw it in my time there and my time doing and building programs there is about collaboration in building a common like a common goal but truly truly um going for it and it's reflected even in the apache Software foundation's model of community over code the community and the relationships that are formed are the paramount of that so it's a bit different 
difficult to separate diversity when you make the community the center part of uh, part of it. And I think that that is what present uh, that presents the lack of awareness, which is this this challenge in diversity. And I think like it makes the people contributing to open source a bit uh, hesitant in recognizing that you know like diversity is a problem, but why if the community is the most important thing for us, right? right? And I think that it's it's not like a blindness or a weak spot. I'm trying I'm trying to articulate this a bit more crispier. But I think that people tend to default a lot on diversity should be, oh, we have more women in the room or oh, we have more people from other culture in the room. When in reality it should be more about even respecting diversity of thoughts amongst people who look and sound the same. And that's where I come down to this lack of awareness. Um, people understand diversity as, okay, yeah, when I walk into the room, I need to see more, more people like me or more people different than me. But in reality, I believe in, in open source specifically, it's more about ideas and more about ways of thinking and ways of communicating, but more of intangible things. And that lack of awareness is really one of those challenges because uh, it's it's hard to see, right? It's hard to to think or default our mindset to be, oh, it's not about how we look, it's about how we interact with each other, how do we form that community and how do we work towards that common goal. That's the first one, lack of awareness. Okay. And then moving on to the friction, what it's hard, I think that that defaults more to the individuals rather than the community. And I'm gonna say why it's defaulted more to that. We can't, one can argue that it's a problem of both the community and the individual, but it's more felt at an individual level, especially if you are somebody trying to become part of that community or that common goal, right? It's the experiences that you feel when you don't like you don't have the the feeling of belonging or you have the you you need you have this quest of becoming part of the community and then those frictions are felt more by the individual than the community and in diversity in that end on the on the friction points we can default to to most obvious things like is language really one friction to not an, to to be preventing diversity for from being a thing in open source. It said the the background of the people that that come in and contribute to open source. So in frictions, I, I think it's more about like those those experiences of the individual, whereas the the lack of awareness is more of the come the the group or 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 the community. So so Griselda really approaches this from a couple of different angles. One is she's talking about the friction, which is the difficulty of, of individuals to get involved with the community. And then she's also talking about the lack of awareness, um, which is more of a community level problem. If I, if I follow along, you know, and that how, how people, you know, how people perceive diversity. Um, and it, what struck me there is this resonated with me the second part a little bit because she said, it's not always about like, having more women in the room or having more people from a, a certain race or a certain culture in the room. It's about sometimes differences in thought. Um, and that's what she mean by, she I was referring to as far as like lack of awareness. Um, I, I feel that resonated with me a little bit because we, we are just now starting to have conversations in our own workplace and all around the technology industry really serious concert, uh, conversations about neurodiversity, um, which is not something that shows up like automatically. Um, and, and, and I have to be very careful here because other things don't always necessarily show it up either. Gender sure. is assumed. You could be wrong about that. So I want to be, you know, cognizant of that as well, but neurodiversity um, is not something, you know, that is, as quickly observed, I guess, oh, and, and yeah, we get into trepidation here really quickly, but I like the way that she brought that in 
because even without neurodiversity into the equation, the real advantage of having diversity in an open source community, uh, at least as how she was approaching it, is different ways of thinking, uh, different ways to solve problems, which is what you know we kind of push when we say this is why we should yeah. have AI. And and diversity, <laughs> wanting diversity in your in your project can be seen as as a purely selfish thing you know more more diversity means more variety of ideas at the table and that ultimately benefits the project um, and we do tend to to view diversity and inclusion efforts on a single axis so we focus on seeing more women in the room as grizz says but uh, but yeah, there there's so many other axes that and some of which are are difficult to measure. So uh, if if uh, <clears throat> if I'm understanding her right, she's saying that that one of the challenges is communicating that it is more than one axis, and that some of these things are really hard to measure. And we do come back to this question of measuring it later on in this in this uh, series. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and. The challenge part of it is, you know, how and the, and the friction is like, and this is the way, you know, I approach this, and and I know you've had conversations around this too. It's like, how do we make things easier for people to join the communities? If you make the onboarding easier for everybody, then your community, in theory, should be more diverse as you go along. That's that's the challenge. Um, and and she you know addresses that as well and 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 how you know we have to get across that feeling of belonging for everybody which you know ties back to earlier conversations we were having around citizenship what does it sure. mean to be a citizen um clearly part of that question is we we you know we need to include diverse thought and diverse backgrounds and cultures and genders and everything else and into the feeling of belonging uh, as part of a community. One of the things that we talked about in citizenship was um, unity of purpose and unity of direction. And sometimes that can be at odds with seeking diversity because you're looking for only people that look like you and think like you. And so mm -hmm. these two things are intention, but when you're essentially, when, when you're a community that's focused around a software product, that unity of thought is directed toward the purpose of the software, not necessarily around your political views or your your uh, your life experience or your socioeconomic status. And uh, those things, when those two things get equated, then you can end up with a community that just looks like you. So, um, so yeah, the, the the distinction between what we just got done talking about with citizenship and this, I think is going to come up with a number of, of interesting counterpoints. Yeah, and and it does. And, and we, uh, it's no big secret, you know, sociologists tell us this all the time, we tend to like to hang out with groups that do look, act, and think like us. Mm -hmm. um, and which is true, but sad. Um, and and on a software project, I think it's sometimes for me, it feels like it's used as an excuse if we want that unity of thought, as you were talking sure. about. And yeah, yeah, that's that's cool. We all want to be moving in roughly the same direction. But if you go too far down that road or too deep into that path, basically, you you end up getting people who will work this work the problem the same way. Um, and and sure, we're all kind of guilty of that. We don't want people in there rocking the boat and making things <laughs> weird and difficult. And wait, why are we talking about this in this way? But that's the challenge we all have to kind of get over. And we have to get over ourselves pretty quickly. Um, otherwise, you are going to have people who just march in lockstep right along with you. So who's our next guest? Our next guest is a colleague of ours from Red Hat. So Clarence Clayton, he is the Senior Manager of Global Data Privacy at Red Hat. Um, 
I have worked with Clarence on a number of projects uh, uh, at Red Hat around data privacy and also DEI projects that he works with as part of uh, our, our programs there. Uh, fantastic person. Um, <laughs> so, and a neighbor of mine. So, we posed the question to Clarence about, you know, hey, when you talk of when you're thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, what are some of the big challenges that you see organizations and communities face? And Clarence gave us some good answers. So when I think of some of the challenges that we face, I think one thing is Red Hat's a great company and Red Hat loves a feel-good story. And sometimes when you talk about the challenges that that many companies, including Red Hat, face with regard to diversity and inclusion, that doesn't always feel as good. So sometimes it's a little bit more challenging to get people to, to buy into that, that conversation, but it's necessary. It's something that we have to talk about because if we don't talk about it, there's certainly not going to be the improvements made that we know need to be made. Um, and when we think about the, the, the community um, as well, it's, making sure that we're doing our part to promote the importance of STEM education at every level, you know, whether you're in elementary school, whether you're in high school or you're in college, there are so many different things that we can do to ensure that we're equipping that next generation of, of STEM leaders and STEM contributors to want to pursue careers in technology and work at places like Red Hat as well. So that was an interesting story. And uh, I, I think I, I resonate with, with his answer here um, because this, is, this has come up in a number of communities where we've started the, the, uh, the DEI conversation and people don't like to hear bad news. People, people don't like to think poorly of themselves. And I, I would even go so far as to say that when you bring up the topic people feel personally accused mm -hmm. and it, it's not just you're saying bad things about my organization. It's you're saying bad things about me personally. You're calling me a bad actor and you're accusing me of bad behavior. And that, that stops the conversation there. And so it's really challenging to have these conversations in a way that is that, that people are willing to accept because it's hard to look at yourself and accept that maybe you could be better because that might mean you're not doing the right things. It, it's really it's really challenging to frame this conversation in a way that yeah. people are willing to accept. Well, and 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 I kind of I I can identify with what he's saying uh, a bit too because it's possible I'm well known for taking things personally. So <laughs> with that in mind. You know, if somebody says, hey, the company that you're working for, which, you know, is part of your identity and we like Red Hat and, and it's everybody, it's it's any company. So we're not just picking on ours, you know, but if that if that's someplace you enjoy working and it's part of your identity and then somebody comes along and says, hey, you're not doing so great around these issues. It's hard not to take that personally yeah. because now you're thinking, OK, Am I contributing to the problem? Mm -hmm. mm, okay, maybe I am, you know, and even if I'm not, you know, am I implicitly agreeing with the problem because I like working for a company that does this, you know, and, and so there's, there's layers and layers there that people, you know, can, can kind of trigger on. And, and we said it at the beginning. If this conversation makes you uncomfortable, okay, um, you know, we're not exactly comfortable with it ourselves, but we want to have the conversation, you know, and, and because that's the point, mm -hmm. um, you know, people need to kind of understand it's not personal. It's not an attack. It's certainly personal as an issue, but it's, it's not a personal attack. Um, sure. when we talk about that. So I was glad that Clarence kind of brought that up um, and, and, and spoke about how, yeah, 
we like our company. Everything's cool here. But you know what? Not everything is cool here. We we have issues around these things. Um, and and then, you know, the funny of, thing is, with, with so many other issues, we're willing to take that you could be better mm -hmm. as a growth opportunity. You could be a better software developer. You could learn this skill. You could learn this new programming language. You could, uh, you know, learn something new that you can leverage in your job and do a better job. But but when it comes to matters of of your personal behavior, mm -hmm. we we have a tendency to say, well, yeah, that's a problem with other people, and I, I'm not willing to I'm not willing to look at myself for that. And if none of us are willing to look at ourselves to see how we could do better, then we'll just stay where we are indefinitely. Yeah, exactly. And and it's weird to me, and I'm sure somebody way smarter than me can explain this, how it always does seem to kind of come around issues of gender, issues of race, issues of religion, where people get really, uh, uh, really like offended by it. And but if you talk to them about personal service, like one issue, that we we have in our corporation and other corporations have this too. It's like, hey, we should all go out and volunteer more. And you know, volunteering is a social issue. And usually nobody complains about it. You know, they say, okay, yeah, let's go volunteer. Let's go build a house or contribute to this charity or whatever. I mean, you, you know, for the most part. Um, but yeah, this one issue always seems to be a, a hang up um, and I'm not making light of it when I refer to it like that. So Clarence also mentions um, encouraging people to take STEM courses in various points in their education. And I believe this is something we came back to later in the conversation with him because he's involved in a number of educational outreach programs and so are you of course. And uh, I believe that that we discussed this later, so I'm not going to go real deep on that there. But uh, you know, if I, I've watched this in my own kids at school, where the uh, the uh, my my son is given certain educational opportunities, and my daughters were not because they're girls, and that's just one small example of of how our education system. Is is kind of filtering based on these implicit biases from day one, and um, having having these increased opportunities, and even even in the gap between my older kids and my youngest, I've seen changes in attitude around this, and so it, it feels like there's there's progress, but it just feels so slow sometimes. Yeah, it it, it does, and and I have all girls, and and I've seen mostly the one side of that it has gotten better uh as you know they've gotten older because there's an eight year spread between the three of them and but you know it it it, it is really challenging um and and i think there's two reasons why we should be pushing stem education at earlier ages one is we should be pushing stem education it's good for your brain <laughs> Um, so that's the the surface primary reason. But the other one I was thinking about when you said that was, if you get kids engaged in STEM in elementary school, middle and high school and, and college, you know, you get them used to the idea of people from different backgrounds also being involved in STEM because you know, in most public schools, at least here in the United States, and I believe a lot of other places, it's a pretty diverse group of kids running around, you know, and, and they're all, you know, tossed together and it's great. And that's an environment that we should kind of say, look, you can do STEM here and oh, by the way, and it just, and then it just becomes more normal mm -hmm. as they get into the workplace. It's like, oh, okay, yeah. And and that seems kind of, you know, Machiavellian a little bit, <laughs> but uh, but but I think that's a secondary benefit that really should resonate. We we need to make this normal at all ages, so people don't get hung up on it. 
So we have one more guest. Right. So we we uh, reached out to Dimitris Chidam, who is currently the Senior Director of Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging Strategy at GitHub. Uh, Dimitris is also uh, a native here in Raleigh, and she uh, used to work for Red Hat uh, not too long ago. Um, and in her new role, she's doing a lot around uh, DEI efforts. So we put this question to her, what is the biggest challenge uh, for uh, DEI efforts? And here's what she had to say. So I think the biggest challenge with diversity efforts is one that we've actually seen before. Think back to how software development used to be prior to the advent of open source. Everyone was working in silos, nothing was shared. Everyone thought that their code was a significant competitive advantage and if they shared it, they would lose their value. Code was layered upon under intellectual property protections. It's such a fixed mindset. But then open source came along and showed us a different way that software development could be done. And we're better for it. Well, what I just described about open source and how it used to be exactly there, this seems to be where it currently is for diversity efforts. There are so many efforts, resources, yeah. money going towards diversity initiatives. And this is so great. It's amazing to see so much active involvement in diversity, equity, and inclusion. But yet the numbers aren't really moving. And I think it's a result of the biggest challenge that I see to diversity efforts. Everything siloed, people aren't collaborating, lots of duplication of efforts. Everyone's trying to solve it themselves, not sharing strategies and what's working and not working for them. They're treating diversity efforts like a competitive advantage, thinking that if I share my strategy with you, then you're going to steal that limited talent pool from me. And then there's that fixed mindset again. That to me is the biggest challenge. But guess what I'm motivated by? As I shared at the start of this answer, we've been there before. We've seen this in open source. Open source knows how to solve for this. And that's what we're doing through this um, community that we started called All In. We are open sourcing diversity, equity, and inclusion. Can you tell us a little bit more about, about the All In effort? Sure, absolutely. So again, All In is a community, not a set of programs, but it's actually a community of stakeholders across open source. Whether you're talking about corporate partners, universities, philanthropists, foundations, government, we're all at the table saying, let's bring the best of who we are and what we do to open source diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we're focusing on it through access, community, equity, and data. And so we've kicked off over the last, uh, well, the last six months, we're in the middle of a 12 month pilot in which we released in partnership with the Linux Foundation, the 2021 Open Source Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Survey. We also launched a maintainers listening tour in which we are going to release a final report about that, hearing from maintainers and community leaders themselves on what they need, the challenges that they see as far as advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion within their communities. And then the last thing is that we had a 12-month pilot focusing on students from underrepresented backgrounds, giving them access and an entryway and an on-ramp into open source. And we're also going to pilot something for maintainers as well. I've never really heard it addressed quite that way, that, that clarity of the siloization mm -hmm. um, and the competitive advantage. So it's it's really cool that we're going to try to use the, the established methods to kind of help fix that. I mean, like when when people come to you and, and, and hear about this program, like what's their big aha moment for them that you see? I think the biggest aha moment is I think diversity and inclusion has been done that way for so long that they didn't even realize that it was being done that way anymore. Mm -hmm. It's like, wait a minute, you're right. We can work together to solve this. I can tell you when I first started this, people were like, I don't think you're going to get corporations that are going to come together and work on this collectively and talk about sharing talent pools and all those things. But then when we started talking to the our corporate partners, they said, this makes sense. We have to do this differently. We need to try a new and novel approach. And who better to do it than GitHub, right? We're at the center of the ecosystem, right? Like everybody uses us and that's a humble brag on my part. And so we're not seen as a competitor. And so we were able to come and step into that 
that void, if you will, so that people know that there's someone that they can work with and someone that can help share resources and pool all those things together. It struck me listening to this, how different the answers are from our different guests. And I guess that just highlights how many challenges there are around this. But uh, I, I really liked her answer um, because it was it was kind of eye opening to me. I, hadn't, I had not thought of it in these terms before. But once she says it, you look around and you see, yeah, everybody's doing this on their own, which is ironic um, when what we're going for is diversity of thought and yet we're siloing and not taking advantage of the diversity of thought across all the different organizations. Yeah, and you know, clearly I was excited about it since I was talking about it quite a bit, but you know, the, the, the idea that diversity is looked upon as a competitive advantage right now between organizations is very, very true. And that was one of those aha moments for me mm -hmm. because it's like, as soon as she said it, I was like, yeah, that's absolutely right. You just didn't think about it. And, um, and she's right that that kind of silization was around in early software development. So with efforts like the all in project, um, and, you know, getting that more, you know, decentralized, so to speak. Um, I think that's going to be a great way of uh, doing it. Um, the, yeah. And it is cool that there is an impartial place where this can happen. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we see some of these efforts, like she said, happening at the Linux Foundation. Um, but, but yeah, GitHub is, is definitely a logical place for this kind of effort to happen. And they've been doing a number of things like this around open source in the last year or so, where uh, they're, they're trying to, to bring an effort together in one place where people can work on it. Like she says, as though it is an open source project, because it kind of is. It is. And I think that, um, what do you kind of call an open source project? You know, an open source community, like all in. You know, the, the term that came to my mind, and I might be being pedantic, is like it's sort of a federated model, you know, mm -hmm. where the model is, you know, syndicated throughout different organizations and you kind of, you take what you need. But either way, uh, it's you're basically getting to the same place, uh, just with maybe different terminology. Uh, I think GitHub, I agree with you 100%. I mean, there are a few companies out there that I think are dedicated to the open source model uh, and collaborative model as Red Hat as something like, you know, GitHub. And I make it yell that about that, but whatever. Um, but I think GitHub, well, let's face it, it's it's in their DNA to build collaborative communities. Um, and and they are kind of seen as a neutral source. Yes, they're a company, they've got to make money, they've got their own revenue model, but they're they're typically regarded pretty well as a as a neutral place, GitLab. Um, I can't leave them out. It's a similar kind of uh, platform. Um, and then and including the Linux Foundation, you know, it's also a, a pretty good step towards getting it out. Um, it also but, gives an opportunity for smaller organizations that can't have dedicated mm -hmm. staff around this particular issue to take advantage of a larger community trying to solve a problem um, without having to hire a full-time uh, DEI officer or a full team or whatever that, that we can do at a larger organization. Right. And we're going to touch on this in a later episode because we, you know, the the reality of a program like All In, yes, it helps smaller organizations. It also helps people in larger organizations, you know, like ours, because sometimes people who are tackling uh, DEI issues um, even in larger corporations can sometimes feel isolated and alone and, and at odds with their fellow associates and, and, and having the tools and the resources and the community support of something like all in mm -hmm. to kind of help them is an amazing resource. So I, and, and again, I'm super excited uh, about where that program is going to be going. Looking back at Clarence's answer, um, it, it can also be difficult within an organization 
to admit that you have a problem to solve, but having an external organization that says, we all have this problem to solve, can remove some of that focus on I'm a bad person and, and recognize that this is a problem that the entire industry and many industries have to solve. And it's something that we can work together on without taking all of the, the burden of guilt on ourselves. Exactly. And, and it even ties back to Griselda's uh, response, which is, you know, that lack of awareness, um, you know, programs like the All In can help bridge awareness gaps across multiple organizations. And you not only you get that feeling of this is a shared problem, because it certainly is, um, you also get the idea, you know, more awareness around, you know, the problem itself and how to approach it from different angles. Um, so seems to solve a lot of the problems that were discussed today. Um, and hopefully we can, you know, we'll see a lot of forward movement with programs like All In. So we've just kind of dipped our toes into this topic. We have a number of more, a number of additional episodes around this general topic. So we hope that you'll come back and join us in uh, the next episodes of this particular series. Yes. So until the next time, my name is Brian Prophet. And I'm Rich Bowen. And thank you for joining us on The Open Road.